Uh, my job today, as Ricky described it uh, to me prior to this meeting and to you just now, is to represent the scholar's perspective with regard to ranking and reputation tracking activities. <clears throat> Before I begin, however, I'd like first to disqualify myself from participating in this conversation. <laughs> I'm not a faculty member, though I do originally come from academia, as, as Ricky told you. Um, I don't work on a campus uh, near faculty members. I work at the CDL, which is in Oakland, um, and uh, is the system-wide library for the University of California. Um, in Oakland, we have a lot of great restaurants and very few faculty. Um, <laughs> which, which can be good and, and can be challenging. Um, and we rely very much on our, um, on our campus partners to help us connect with faculty. Um, and it, it's also not my job currently to uh, collect any metrics about faculty or reputation and institutional rankings. Um, in fact, I'm an accidental participant in this space. I bumped into the topic of institutional ranking and reputation when I thought I was working on implementing the University of California's open access policy. <clears throat> Given my lack of qualifications for this discussion, I thought it might be a good strategy to begin today by, uh, as one begins when one is underqualified, by interrogating categories. Um, what do we mean when we speak of scholars? On the left is Rembrandt's rendering of the traditional scholar ensconced with his tomes, the light at his back, taciturnly and perhaps only momentarily turned toward the viewer, clearly desirous of solitary engagement with his subject. On the right, the epitome of the transparent, data-driven, forward-facing researcher, keen to communicate his subject, to engage his audience in his findings, which in fact are more visible than he. Clearly, both of these representations are fantasies. They are idealized conceptions of what it means to be a scholar, and depending on your personal inclinations, are more or less compelling. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, while clearly oversimplifications of the complex environments that shape a scholar and in which a scholar works, these tropes are often invoked, explicitly or implicitly, as the shorthand by which we distinguish between the humanities and STEM fields in the setting of an increasingly digital and open scholarly communications environment. The reality is, of course, that most folks fall somewhere in between these two tropes of the scholar. In fact, there are multiplicities of scholars and multiplicities of fields of practice and measures of value. It is these multiplicities that so challenge our efforts to offer a nuanced measure of faculty activities, or for that matter, to even engage faculty in the process of measuring their activities in a nuanced way. Their scholarly workflows are unique. Their publications of record are unique. Their professional standards are unique. That said, there are some general trends that emerge within certain domains, and I'm here to describe some of those trends explicitly within the setting of open access policy implementation and its potential to converge with the work of tracking reputation and ranking, and particularly within the humanities. There have been passing references to the humanities over the past day and a half, or maybe it's just one day. If I was here another day, too. There was a prior day, before the day. Um, <laughs> Um, mostly rueful acknowledgments of the difficulty of fitting these fields into the box of quantifiable productivity. What is it about the humanists that makes them, and here I will generalize, so disinclined and so ill-suited to this new trend in research productivity tracking? In some cases, take the fine arts, there is a substantial mismatch between the scholarly product, the dance, the poem, the painting, and the measuring stick. But what about all those fields whose primary professional activity, much like their STEM brethren, is the publication of scholarly works? Sure, the frequency of publication needs, may need to be recalibrated, and the genre of choice may need to be lengthened. But the end result is still typically a peer-reviewed work published in a journal or with a publisher of some greater or lesser merit. It sounds pretty similar. The real difference, and it's not rocket science to point it out, I think, is funding. For those in STEM fields, some amount of quantification of work, productivity, or scholarly engagement is already de rigueur as a result of the funding environment. 
These are the folks who have lived for some time in the world of funder requirements, H indexes, and regulatory reporting. For the humanists, <laughs> let's take a moment to absorb that. Um, for the humanists, and here's my thesis, the quantitative analysis of research output is a chilling embodiment of the brave new world of the corporatized university. At best, indifferent, at worst, hostile to the disciplines that don't bring in substantial resources and produce the kind of research that has the potential to fuel patents and corporate partnerships. I want to pause here to share some um, slides that I think are relevant to this assertion. Uh, these slides come from a report from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, some of you may have seen it, titled The State of the Humanities Funding 2014. The first slide is a happy story. It shows increased research and development expenditures in the humanities, an upward trend from 2005 to 2012. It's important to note, however, that federal funding, state, uh, state support for higher education, and charitable giving to the humanities have all been flagging since 2007. So though the trend is upward, um, certain sectors of funding are, have not uh, followed suit. This next slide is a sobering and maybe not possible to even see from the back, um, but not surprising representation of the relative research and development expenditures among the humanities and other fields of study. There's nothing too surprising here once you get past the orders of magnitude difference, and if I had a pointer I would show you, but the humanities are the uh, second from the right, just past law, which is vanishingly small. Um, uh, once you get past the orders of magnitude difference and recognize the significantly sharper upward trend in funding in virtually all disciplines other than the humanities. Expenditures on medical research were in fact 60 times larger than funding for research in the humanities. Spending for the humanities research, spending for humanities research equaled 0.55% of the amount dedicated to science and engineering R&D. This, however, is the slide that really, I think, gives one pause, certainly gave me pause. Um, the sources of research and development funding for different disciplines. So humanities is at the top left, uh, then uh, behavioral so and social sciences, biological sciences, and on the bottom, education, engineering, mathematical and physical sciences, medical sciences. Yellow represents federal funding. Red represents not-for-profit organizational funding. And blue represents academic institutional funding. Biological sciences, medical sciences, mathematical and physical sciences, engineering, even education derive the majority of their funding from the federal government. The federal funding for the humanities, however, is not so rosy. The NEH, the principal federal agency supporting projects in the humanities, which prospered from the late 60s to, the to 1979 before funding fell sharply in the 80s, um, has a, again uh, experienced a, a funding um, crash in, in the mid-90s. After a slight surge in funding that peaked in 2010, the funds have fallen again in recent years due to inflation and cuts in appropriations. Um, then there's private funding for the humanities, which takes myriad forms, but foundations are a substantial so source of support. Data from the Foundation Center suggests that this is another area of funding contraction for the humanities. After increasing 43%, from 2002 to 2007, um, in, in preliminary estimates for 2012, it appears that the humanities um, have, uh, the, the private funding has fallen 18%, or fell 18% in 2012, and perhaps has continued that trend. It appears that the humanities alone, in this, uh, ch in this graph, are predominantly dependent on their home institutions for their existence. So what happens when that home institution develops robust tools for pra tracking productivity and impact and even value? Okay, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit, having laid that groundwork, and return to the setting in which I have recently and unwittingly bumped up against this issue. Before you is, a home page, is the homepage of eScholarship, which is UC's open access repository and publishing platform. If you can read the text, you can probably see references to UC's open access policy adopted in July 2013 and covering all 12,315 academic senate represented faculty at UC across the 10 campuses. 
My team's job in partnership with the UC libraries is to help these faculty get their published scholarly articles into e-scholarship in accordance with the terms of their own policy. The Senate has asked us to do this, and it's a hard job for a few reasons. First, awareness. <clears throat> it is hard to reach 12,315 people and get them to, uh, up to speed on the terms of an open access policy. These things are notoriously complex, and 12,315 people can hide pretty easily in the state of California. <laughs> Efficiency is another challenge we face uh, bringing it to the environment. It's hard to convince 12,315 busy people to add another task to their long list, even if they agree in principle with the tenets of the policy. Scale. It's hard to implement anything across 10 campuses that have dramatically distinct resources and idiosyncratic, though all lovable, cultures. <laughs> and finally, value. If you do try something this daunting with 12,315 faculty, you better have a good reason for doing it. In other words, what's in it for them? As we grappled with these problems, we lit upon the idea of using a research information management system as an efficient and intuitive way to engage UC faculty in their policy, minimizing the effort it takes to deposit their publications in e-scholarship. With a research information management system, we could collect metadata for faculty publications harvested from various indexes, thus sparing the faculty the work of filling out onerous metadata fields in onerous submission forms and enabling them instead to claim a publication, the check mark is a claim, the X is a reject, and upload a file when alerted by email. So they get an email in their inbox, they click on a link, they go into this system which they can log into with their campus credentials, and they see the list of their, uh, their the metadata records for their publications and they can claim or reject them there. We could even hook up this system to other systems, sparing the faculty the work of interacting with multiple systems to achieve a single purpose, the accurate maintenance of their scholarly record. We were excited. We went on a grand tour of the 10 UC campuses, crisscrossing the state to spread the good news to the local Senate library committees. And it was good news. They had asked for something where you could just drag and drop. Can I just drag and drop? And a click felt very much like a drag and drop or close. We thought we had good news. Until they saw this slide. While we were busy talking about how convenient it would be to use this system to track all their activities and perhaps even integrate with their annual reporting systems on their campuses, all they could see was the publications per year visual. <laughs> Why did we need that? Would we run comparative studies within departments? across campuses? Who would have access to this data? <laughs> Suddenly, we didn't have such a great conversation going. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the concerns. And, and, and Ginny Steele did a great job of describing some of this yesterday in her discussion uh, about OPUS. Um, and a lot of these same issues have come up for us. Um, I don't want the intellectual work I do reduced to meaningless numbers in spreadsheets. There is no single measure of value beyond peer review. I don't want any data about me managed centrally, even if it is public data. And in our case, it's even uh, perhaps a more pressing issue because managed centrally can mean managed centrally on a campus or managed centrally at a consortial location like the CDL, which feels even more removed from one's own hard drive. This open access policy valorizes the article as the publication of choice. And this research information management system reinforces that arbitrary category of value. In other words, all these anxieties coalesced, or sorry, all these concerns coalesced around an anxiety about the potential misinterpretation and subsequent misuse of data about their scholarly enterprise. This interpretation is, of course, a cardinal sin within the humanities, but it is particularly onerous when practiced by those who hold purse strings and by those whose budgetary allocations, one's, by, by whose budgetary allocations one's department could rise or fall. Needless to say, we stopped talking about everything that symplectic elements could do and focused instead on the publication metadata harvesting piece. 
Reflecting on this trend toward anxiety about research information management systems within the humanities, and this anxiety, I think, is qualitatively different than the annoyance or frustration we encountered uh, when talking to other fields. Now, of course, these are gross generalizations. Please uh, bear with me. Um, it looks more and more like a manifestation of the larger crisis in the humanities in our time. Humanities have little purchase beyond the walls of academia, increasingly. Um, Perhaps the most visible uh, discussion of the humanities these days is the list that comes out, maybe it's Fox News, of the ridiculous studies that people do and how they get funded to study things that are outrageous and aren't we wasting our money. Um, there's less direct application of research to the well-being and progress of humanity. Uh, a lot of what drives open, um, open access is the desire to have data available um, in ways that can have real implications for health management and um, safety, issues like that. Um, the humanities have difficulty translating their value. And, as I've mentioned before, um, they are institutionally subsidized in the setting of uh, an increasingly corporatized institutions. So what can or should the library do? Here I reference conversations that I've had with Meg Buzzy, a colleague of mine who directs the OPUS program at UCLA, um, and who shares many of my own challenges in acclimating faculty to new methods for tracking scholarly activity. The first thing we can do is hear the concerns and understand where they're coming from. They're legitimate concerns. Sometimes they're hysterical and sometimes they're reasonable, but they're real concerns, and uh, it's important to acknowledge that. Um, help faculty understand that numbers alone can't tell the full story, um, but they open up uh, the conversation and give us the opportunity to tell the story. Advocate for the importance of telling the story and developing a bridge voice, a voice that can translate between one's own peers and that very focused uh, professional conversation and conversations with uh, the, the community, other funders, stakeholders, uh, the general public, to help, to help communicate the importance of that work. And then we can help them tell the story. Um, we can work with them to find ways to highlight the value of what they do and to celebrate it. So what are my goals given this uh, journey that we've been on? My practical goal is to overcome distrust and integrate uh, the open access infrastructure at, uh, at UC with other data tracking activities. We have an opportunity if we connect symplectic elements to all of these amazing systems on the campuses like Opus um, to eliminate redundant work, to consolidate infrastructure, and to embed the open access policy with known processes. So we're going to get more traction if, we're, if our process and our workflow is part of things that the faculty already are required to do. And, um, and those requirements could be, uh, the, the burden of those requirements could be ameliorated to some degree if our system can, can help. But philosophically, oops, <laughs> philosophically, wait, did that work? Yes. Um, uh, my goal is to make sure that we make the time to do justice to the humanities as we build systems to measure the value the ac that academia brings to the world. Thank you. Thank you.